us first. And God, we thank you that you lavished your love on us. God, help us to love like you. Help us to honor you by loving you. Lord, to love you with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind. So God, we come this morning to worship and adore you. God, help the words to ring true that we love you more than anything. So God, we ask right now that you would bless us, God. God, that you would open up our ears that we might hear. Open up our hearts, Lord, that your word might be deposited deep inside of us. To the end, God, that we might be different than when we walked in the door. God, we pray right now that a soul might be saved and a heart might be changed. We love you, Lord, and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Give God a hand of praise. He is a faithful, faithful, faithful God. Amen. If you have your Bibles uh, with you, turn to Colossians. Just a couple chapters over from Ephesians where we've been spending the last few months. Amen. Uh, today we're going to be starting a new uh, sermon series in Colossians. Amen. And I will give you a little bit more about that, but I want to get this word, this scripture out to us. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. And the word of God says this. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, because by him everything was created in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn soul, from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross whether things on earth or things in heaven amen for his word Listen, the May 14, 2015 Charisma Magazine article, Seven Traits of a False Teacher, speaks to a dilemma in the church today. False teachers and their false teaching. See, a false teacher can be anyone in a position of spiritual authority or claiming to be. Listen, wolves don't often attack wolves. But they do go after sheep. Mm -hmm. See, they bring destructive heresies and destructive teaching and lies into the church, often by telling people what they want to hear. The article goes on and says, they provide layers of truth mixed with error, but even a broken clock is right twice a day. Listen, the word of God says, Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. See, to beware means to be on alert, to discern what is being said. False teachers take advantage of the fact that many people are not well educated in fundamental biblical truths. See, to detect a counterfeit, the author uh, uh, puts forth, you must know what the real thing is. You must know the real thing. Those who deal with counterfeits, they study what the real thing is. Uh, ladies, some of you got some real Gucci bags and some, some, some real things, some real Michael Coors, amen. You didn't get it down on 6th Street, man, at the man calling you over to the alley, amen. 
But many of you know the real from the fake because you've handled with the real thing. Right. You, you've seen the real thing. You know what the stitching looks like on the real thing. You know what the emblems and all those things look like on the real thing. So when a fake comes, you go, that ain't the real thing. See, false teachers put forth those things that are fake, and we must understand what it is to under, to know what the truth is. Amen? Amen? Listen, he says here, wolves don't advertise. Instead, they look like sheep. Right. You know, you don't see a, a wolf come into church with a t-shirt on that says, I'm a wolf and I'm proud of it. <laughs> and, and, and he doesn't come in, don't, don't stand by me, I'm going to eat you up. They don't advertise. He comes in like, God bless you, brother. May the Lord richly bless you. Hey, brother, how you doing? You coming to the men's fellowship? God bless you. Hey, sister, you looking well in the Lord today. Amen. And then the, the, the whoop even will come up and grab the Bible and say, turn your Bible to. See, because wolves are in every position of authority. Amen. See, what we're talking about here, Jesus encourages his followers to be uh, fruit inspectors. Listen, a wolf will always show his teeth. Amen. He not, he's not going to be content with grazing in the grass. Amen. He's going to show his teeth. We must understand what the real genuine article is. Amen. Listen. Uh, Jesus tells us that we got to be those who look at the fruits. So this author came across a, a great article from the Gospel Coalition written by Colin Smith entitled, Seven Traits of False Teachers. See, this article talks about how to identify the fruit of false teachers. He compares the authentic with the counterfeit, as we saw when we looked at first and second Peter. Listen, Colin Smith proposes there are seven traits to consider when dealing with false teachers. See, false teachers have a different source. They have a different source. You want to ask, where does this message come from? Amen. They may propose that it comes from the word, but if you have looked at the real thing, you know that that's a different source. See, Peter told them, hey, don't, don't look at these stories of men, these myths and fairy tales, amen. I, I, I've heard some preachers, and I'm like, man, that's a nice tale you wo you woven together, amen. Right. You might be able to sell that so, to some publisher somewhere, but that didn't come out the word, right, right. amen. They got a different source. They have a different message, amen. What is the substance of the message for a true teacher Christ is always going to be central. Amen? Uh, 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 the one who teaches the word of God will show you we have everything we need in the word. Amen? Also, they have a different position. In what position will, you, will the message leave you in? Will it leave you in depending on Christ or will it leave you lacking? Will it leave you with your ticket to hell when you thought you bought first class on the way to heaven? They also teach a different character. What kind of people does the message produce? Right. Listen, good teachers pre, uh, uh, teach, and they produce like kind. Right. So a false teacher, if he's feeding you false teaching, amen, and you're buying it hook, line, and seeker, your produce going to be bad. Right. Yeah. All right. See, they also, it leads to a different character. What kind of people does the message, again, produce? What do you look like? It also has a different appeal. Why should you listen to the message? The true teacher appeals to scripture. The false teacher makes a rather different appeal, appealing to your lustful desires, appealing to your itching ears, appealing to the things you want and not necessarily the things you, the scripture says that you need. And also the six things that is at that eight will show a different fruit. What result does the message have in people's lives? Amen. We got some folk in, in the church looking at rotten fruit and saying it looks fresh. Right, right, right. And looking at the fruit, you don't want to hurt their feelings. You're like, hey, what, your fruit is rotten. Oh, who are you to judge me? Well, no, the Bible tells us we're to be fruit inspectors. Amen. 
And then ultimately, number seven is that it comes to a different end. Where does the message ultimately lead you? If it does not have Christ at the center, it will leave you lacking. But today, as we start this new sermon series, I want to concentrate on the fact that 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 the church at the Colossians was dealing with one aspect of these false teachings, a different message. See, they had heard the fact that, that, they, that they had false teachers among them that were introducing these destructive heresies, amen, denying the very sovereign Christ who had established the church, amen. See, they had a movement away from the centrality of Christ, amen. The false teachers will speak about how other people can change their lives, but they'll leave Christ as the changing agent out, amen. In the church at Colossae, there was a similar problem that was going on like today. Amen. These false teachers had entered the ranks of the church and threatened to undermine the very foundation of the church. See, the person and the work of Christ himself is central to the church and central to a Christian's faith. Amen. Amen. The apostle Paul set out here in this word to right the ship that was in danger of running aground. See, this is our starting point for our series in Colossians, amen, Christ the center. See, Paul's letter to the Ephesians gave us the blueprint for the church, amen. We saw the blueprint, a blueprint for our families, a blueprint for spiritual warfare. He gave us a blueprint for the church that he established. We learned that he was the chief cornerstone and that everything else was built based on him. Amen. Here in Colossians, Paul turns his attention not to just the church, but the supremacy of Christ. Amen. Listen, don't don't treat Christ as second rate. He is preeminent. Amen. That means he is supreme. And so Colossians centers on Christ. It centers on who he is, his identity, amen, and what he has done for us as the church and as mankind. As we spend a little time today and, and moving forward in this book, we will see that Christ is truly Lord. See, there's a, some important themes that we'll deal with in the epistle to the Colossians. See, they include us dealing with the doctrine of salvation. I know many of us hear the word doctrine, and we, we get a little nervous. I don't want to hear no doctrine. I just want to praise the Lord. Well, the Bible is full of doctrine. It's simply just teaching, amen? Don't let the, the theological word fool you, but you need to understand. You need to have some right doctrine. You need to understand what salvation is. You need to understand your Christian liberty. You need to understand ethics and prayer, amen? You need to understand what it means to rest in Christ. However, some of these themes, the main emphasis of this book is on Christ and his position in relation to the creation and the church. See, in Paul's view here, Christ stands supreme and unique. He stands supreme and unique. He is the one and true living God. He is before all things. He created all things. And he is, first of all, over all creation. He is Savior who delivers us from the hands of Satan. He makes atonement and brings forgiveness of sin. So this epistle is all about the greatness of Christ, his person, his position, amen, and in him that we have our faith. See, Paul's intention here based in this letter is to bring Jesus Christ to the forefront because he must be acknowledged as creator and redeemer. It's interesting that there's churches today named with, with, with Jesus all over them, crosses erected, amen, but Jesus is an afterthought. You know, they do good things. They may serve the hungry. They, they may clothe the naked. They may do all these things, but they forget about Jesus. They think they can do these things without Christ, without holding to his word. Right, right, right. Colossians, Paul uses it to, to get us back on track to understand that it is all about Jesus. So if you want to, to, to have a title today, this is our, our opening uh, sermon today. It is simply Christ the Center. Christ the center. 
and, and what you want, we want to learn today is that Christ is central to creation and his church. Christ is central, amen, not Central Avenue, amen. He is central of central importance, amen. He is the centerpiece of creation and his church. So let's talk a little bit more about this letter. I want us to get a, a better picture of this. Listen, Paul was possibly, this is considered one of his prison epistles. You know, if you did some time, don't worry about it. Paul did time too. <laughs> Amen. Uh, many commentators believe that he was writing from prison. He wrote, uh, uh, some believe, five prison epistles. Amen. Ephesians. Colossians, amen, uh, 2 Timothy, Philemon, amen. He, he, he wrote these, these, these books from prison, amen. And, and he, had, uh, he was in Rome, and, and while he was in Rome, he had the freedom to write. He had the freedom for individuals to come and minister to him, and he often would use that opportunity to send letters to churches to encourage them, amen. Listen, Paul had never been to the Colossian church. Never visited it. He didn't establish it. Amen. We, we learn from scripture and, and, and what's been taught in tradition that the church was probably established and founded by Epaphras. Amen. Uh, also, uh, two characters that, that rise up out of the New Testament, Paul's New Testament writing is Philemon and Onesimus, and they were probably from Colossae. Amen. See, the, the letter was written to encourage a group of believers who were growing spiritually. And the letter was written to warn uh, these believers who were being confronted with false teachers, which undermine the fact that Christ is Lord, that Christ is supreme. Amen. Amen. And, and not only that, they, they were trying to teach that would undermine the sufficiency of Christ. Do you understand that the Bible teaches us is that Jesus is all sufficient. He is a sufficient sacrifice for our sins. We had these false teachers, amen, that were coming along teaching that, no, 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 Christ's sacrifice was not sufficient. Many believe that this letter from Colossians is a complimentary book to Ephesians, amen? They believe that as Paul was uh, writing to uh, uh, Philemon, who used to be uh, the master of Onesimus, Paul was writing a letter to, to him to say, listen, this is my brother. I know he ran away from you, but you need to welcome him back into the fold. Amen. He, he, he may be a slave technically, but you are a slave as well to the same God. Amen. So many believe that as Paul was penning this letter, that, that he also wrote Ephesians and Colossians. Amen? Because in order to, to get to Ephesians, uh, Ephesus, you had to go through Colossae. Right, 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 right. Amen? Listen, Colossae was located 100 miles east of Ephesus, together uh, with uh, Iropolis and Laodicea. This was called the Lycus Valley. I'm giving you a little, little background. Amen? Because when you read the word, you need to understand that the context, the setting of what was going on at the time. Amen. At one time, this tri-city area in the Lycus Valley was a central piece uh, of, of uh, merchandising. Amen. It is now in what's called common day Turkey. Once an important city, by the time of Paul, Colossae had become a small market town. See, in this area, the Lycus Valley is sort of like Southern California, amen. They, they sat on these faults, and they had many, many earthquakes, amen. And many of these earthquakes had caused some ruin to these towns. So these vibrant towns, some of them had become small cities, and this is Colossae. It was once important, but some now call it a small town. Amen. Their population was a mix of Jews and Gentiles. Amen. Listen, this city was a city that manufactured and exported wool products, where the, which were the principal industry. It's interesting that, that wolves that show up in sheep clothing would want to go where they got the best wool. That's another, that's another, that's another lesson. That's another lesson. So, so again, we have all this going on in this little bitty town. Paul is taking his time out to write to them. So let's get a little context. Let's see what the word of God says. 
Let's look at verses 3 through 8. Verses 3 through 8, we see Paul giving thanks for the church's understanding of the truth of the gospel. He says here, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the, of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the message of truth, the gospel. See, he was telling them that, listen, you heard the message. And, and I thank God for when I think about you, I'm praying for you, amen, because you have responded to the gospel message, the truth of the gospel. Then verses 9 through 14, Paul tells the church how he is praying for their continued spiritual growth. Listen in verse 9, he says this, for this reason also, since the day uh, we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in knowledge of God. Man, don't you want somebody to pray that for you? Amen. That's what I pray uh, for our church, that we would grow. Amen. That we would grow in Christ, be pleasing. Amen. In all wisdom and knowledge. He is praying that they be in the center of God's will. When you see that phrase, walk worthy, he's talking about your lifestyle being worthy of your relationship with Christ. Amen. He's telling them that he wants to pray for them to grow. See, as we look at that context here, it begins to point us to the fact that Christ is central to creation and his church. Let's look at our scripture text. The first thing we, we understand from these verses is that Christ is central to all creation, to all creation. This morning, as we prepare for worship, uh, 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 Michelle led us in the song that uh, this is the, the day that the Lord has made. And, and I posited the fact that it, it ain't been a day that he ain't made. Right, right, right. And see, we need to rejoice because he is the one who makes day. He is the one that is central to all creation. You don't believe me? Look what verse 15 says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. See, when Paul wrote to the Colossians, he was countering a clever company of false teachers who sought to replace the Colossians' enthusiastic devotion to Christ with only a mild approval of him. See, they, they didn't encourage anyone to forget Jesus altogether. They just said that he wasn't, only, he wasn't the only show in town. It was some other things that we can add to your Christianity. See, according to these false teachers, Jesus got equal billing to the vast emanations of deity. Understand this, just like what was going on in Ephesians with this mishmash of all kind of religions, the same thing was going on in Colossae. You had uh, Jewish mysticism. You had Gnost the beginnings of what's called Gnosticism, which basically means that knowledge. In Gnosticism, that means that they taught that all material things were evil. And only that that was spiritual can be good. See, that was problematic because the Bible teaches that Jesus came in the flesh. Amen. And so in order for Jesus to truly be Christ, he couldn't be flesh because flesh is evil. Amen. So the church had all these things coming in and they were trying to undermine the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Listen, it says that he is the image of the invisible God. The word for image, it was used in Paul's time for likeness, or like those likenesses on coins or portraits for, or on statues. It carries the idea of correspondence to the original. Has anybody in here ever seen Abe Lincoln? No, nobody here. If, if you have, let me have a chat with you afterwards. Amen. <laughs> but amen, when we look at, at the penny, we see his likeness. If I showed you a picture of him today, you would say, that's Abe Lincoln. Right. Amen. It is a representative uh, of him, amen, of the original. 
Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He was a physical representation of God the Father. Amen. Jesus often telling them, like, we ain't nobody ever seen God. He said, you seen me, you seen the Father. He is the visible representation. He is the image. Amen. I was talking to uh, little Jeremiah, our son, one day, and I asked him, uh, he, we were looking at some pictures, and I said, uh, you know, that's, that's my mama. That he called, the girls used to call my mom Ma May. Amen. You know, we black, we give them all kind of names. Ma May, <laughs> some of us. Amen. And, and so he's looking at the pictures. He's, like, he's never met Ma May before. Amen. But the picture is a physical representation of her. So when I show him another picture, he goes, that's Ma May. Listen, when we look at Jesus, when they, Jesus was the physical manifestation of God the Father. He was the image of the visible God. And listen, don't let this firstborn of all creation fool you. You know, we got some, some Jehovah Witnesses that are teach you. See, I told you Jesus was created. He was a created being. Amen. Firstborn, when you see this in Scripture, does not necessarily mean that you, that that individual was born in the family physically first. It means that that person is in the position, the favored position. We often see all throughout the Old Testament, those who had the, the that were, were the phys physical firstborn were not the ones who end up with the inheritance. Amen. Listen, Jesus is the firstborn. That means that he ranks first in all creation. Amen. He is God because he is first in all creation. He is firstborn because he is number one in rank. He is in the honored position. Amen. Verse 16 tells us, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Listen, if you want to try to debate, amen, it says here, for everything, amen. You don't have to get too deep. You don't have to get real crazy, amen. Everything means everything was created by him in heaven and on earth. See, how can everything be created by him if he was created? Amen. And, and listen, it says that those things visible and vis invisible. So those in the material realm as well as those in the spiritual realm were created by him. Listen, some folks sit on the throne and they think they're king and Jesus is like, listen, the very throne you sit on is mine. Matter of fact, when they went to go put get the wood and the gold and everything they did to put that throne together, amen, I'm the one that created it. Amen. I love the Old Testament. The Old Testament is funny sometimes. I remember reading, and God is, is speaking to one of the prophets. He's telling them, tell these idiots, listen, the very wood that you cut, that you put uh, to, in, in the fire to warm you, that you use to cook your food, then you shape it into some image and worship it. You... The, 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 the image that you made, how can something worship that's created worship something they created? See, the, the, the word of God will show us our own stupidity if we just listen enough. It's telling us in the scripture that Jesus created everything, period. Amen? Then I love verse 17. He says, he is before all things, and by him all things Hold together. Right, right, right. See, Christ has no beginning. He has no end. Amen. His, his, his physical ministry was but a chapter, but he has always been God. Right. There has never been a time when Jesus was not God. Amen. He was before the beginning, and he will be before there is an end, because he is eternal. Amen. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Listen, I know that, that you think you are holding your life together. 
I think I know you you think that it's your, your job and I know you think it's your big fat bank account and, and your your smarts, amen. As the old folks say, your your smarts. It, it's not that. God holds everything together by his power, amen. It is Jesus who sustains us. It is Jesus that holds all things together. See, his power guarantees that the universe is under control and not chaotic. Amen? See, he is. Christ is central to his creation. Not only that, Christ is central to his church. Nah, don't believe me. Verse 18 says this. He is also head of the body. The church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. See, Jesus is sovereign over creation, but he is also sovereign over the church. Amen? His new creation. Jesus has sovereign power over the church because he is the head. Don't get it twisted. I know some people may think that they're the head of their church. You're not the head of your church. Amen. Christ is the head of the church. Listen, I know some folk may say, oh, well, well, pastor, you're the shepherd. No, I'm an under shepherd. I'm a sheep. Amen. I, I'm just a shepherd. I got on roll, uh, uh, may have a, a shepherd robe on with a staff, but I got wool on too. Right, right. Amen. All, all of us have to understand that Christ is the head of of the church amen he is the one he is the firstborn he is the origin of the church he has authority over the church amen Jesus began his church and he is the source of the life and vitality of the church Jesus is sovereign over his creation the church the church is his vehicle amen that that he uses to move the gospel message forward and he is the only one that is in control amen, amen. all of us are replaceable parts amen. but the only one you can never replace in the church is Christ amen. he is supreme the context of his supremacy certainly lends itself to the idea that he is the authority in the church the church is the body of believers who owe their allegiance to Jesus. Listen, many of us, we, you know, in our country, we pledge our allegiance, uh, you know, to the United States. Amen. We put our right hand over our heart and we look at the flag and, and, and we listen to the songs and we, I mean, we get all. But listen, is your allegiance to Christ? Is your allegiance something that on Sunday morning you stand, you know, with your hands clasped, clasped together and you do some empty word, amen, or, or empty prayer, or do you really, your heart really belong right. to him? Right. Yeah. Amen. Is he truly central to your life? Yeah. See, be, uh, listen, the church belongs to Jesus because he is the resurrection. The work of reconciliation took place in him. He is the firstborn from among the dead. Again, here it is about his position. Christ raised others from the dead before he came. He raised Lazarus, amen. Uh, Reverend Marty preached on the, the little boy, de dead boy's funeral, amen, that Jesus showed up to, and, and, he, and he called that, that boy back to life, amen, and gave him back to his mother. So there were others who had risen from the dead first, but it shows here he is the firstborn among the dead, means that he has preeminence in resurrection because we learned last week because he rose from the dead because he was the one that was risen that one day we shall rise because he rose first. He rose first never to die again. And one day we will rise never to taste death again. See, all that is right here in these verses, amen, showing us the supremacy of Christ. Verses 19 and 20 tell us this, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. See, Jesus has supremacy over all things because all of God's fullness resides in Jesus. He is the full embodiment of God's attributes and saving grace. Uh, don't miss this. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ. 
Do, do you know Christ is, and let me just give you the term. I know y'all you, been in church more than two weeks. So you've heard it before. Omniscience. Yeah. That means all-knowing. Jesus is all-knowing. That, that same quality is shared with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's omnipotent. Amen. All-powerful. He shares that same quality right. with the Father right. and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right. Right. He's omnipresent. Amen. That means that Christ can be anywhere at any time. Amen. He shares that same quality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's saying here that, listen, the fullness of God dwells in Christ because he is God. And through him, he reconciled everything to himself. We, we learned that, that uh, during our resurrection time that, that in order for us to be saved, there had to be a perfect sacrifice. Right, right. A perfect sacrifice. Uh, uh, we, we could not do it, amen? Right. There had to be a perfect sacrifice. So God sent himself, right. sent his only begotten son where the fullness of deity dwelt in him. And he paid the full right. price for our sins on the cross. Amen? Amen? He thought, he said, I want to reconcile mankind back to myself. And he sent Christ to do it. He reconciled everything to himself by making peace through the blood. That Don't miss that. Peace is important. See, it's because of Christ we have peace with God. Do you know we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity? With, that means that we came here as God's enemy. I know you always said, no, I love the man upstairs. I, I, I've always had a good relationship with God. No, the Bible says that if you are not with Christ, you are against him. So before you came to Christ, you were his enemy. And it needed to be a peace treaty between you and God the Father. And the only way that peace treaty could be brokered is by the blood of Jesus. That was a peace treaty that was brokered on the cross. Amen. By God and God alone. It's through the cross that he took care of our sin debt. It's through the cross that he did all this for us. Through the cross, he brought us and restored harmony between us and God the Father. He patched things up for us on the cross. Amen. He ceased all hostilities against us on the cross. He went to God to bury the hatchet on our behalf. He smoked the peace pipe. He healed the breach at the cross. See, he is the one who is central to creation. It is, he is central to the church. I, I love Israel, how the soul, Jesus at the center. Amen. He is at, at the center of it all. Amen. He talks about from beginning to the end, he is at the center. Talks about the fact that, listen, everybody, you can deny it if you want. He is the center. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue should confess. He says, nothing else matters. <laughs> Amen. Because Jesus is the center. So, so why is this important as we start this, 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 this time in Colossians? Why is it important for us to understand that Christ is the center? Christ is central to creation. He's central to the church. What does that matter to us? Listen, as Christians, it's all in a name. See, it's all, it's all in a name. See, without Christ, there is no Christianity. Uh, with, without Christ, we are here, like I told you a week or so ago, we're spinning our wheels without Christ. It's all in a name. If Christ is not the centerpiece of your life, you, you, you why fake the funk? Amen. Why, why, why present yourself and say, hey, I'm a Christian. How are you going to be a Christian with no Christ? It's important for us to understand that you have those that are out there teaching things that would undermine the fact that Jesus has to be central in your life. It's not your good deeds that are central. Because Paul says your good deeds are like filthy rags. Amen. It's not your accomplishments that are, that are not essential. The, the, the degrees you have up on the wall. Amen. How many businesses you've done. Uh, your, your, your corporate client. That's not it. Because Paul said that, listen, he says that's like dumb. 
<laughs> he says, I, I give that all up for Christ. If Christ is not the center of your life, then what life for us is not even worth living. Christ has to be the center. Amen. And once you understand he's the center, then you begin to, all life begins to flow from him. See, the only Christ that saves and delivers and heals and forgives and restores is the one that is at the center of it all. We're, listen, we may not be part of the Colossian church, however, still today, preachers and teachers peddling a false Jesus. And I say peddling because they, they are pipping out Christ for their own gain. I know that's a strong, strong term, but, but God is not playing. Amen. He sent his son to save, to deliver, amen, not as a, a revenue stream for you to pad your pockets. He is the invisible, he is the visible representation of the visible God. He is God. So we got to be careful. We got to understand that he is truly God. Everything was created for him, by him, and through him. If Christ is not the center, then today is an opportunity to get your life centered on him. Listen, we can't play around with this. It is so many that go to church in ministry and Christ is not the center of their lives. See, at the church of Colossians, Paul was dealing with the fact that they have false teachers yeah. telling them that you can have the gospel plus program <laughs> telling them that you 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 listen you can be special if, if you just super spiritual and, and you're not really saved if you're not part of our clique that you you didn't go through this process you didn't take this class and you didn't join this team amen God said that Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of all creation. He is the one who gave his life for your sins, for my sins. He needs to be center of our lives. Christ is the center. Make sure that he is the center of your life. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. Oh.